Ok, well, good morning, bon dia, buenos dias, bon dia tout um, Today we have the first activity, open activity of the Semana de la Investigación, our research week. I'm Carlos Escolari, I'm the coordinator of the PhD program in communication at the Department of Communication in Pompeu Fabra University in Barcelona. Um, well, um, this uh, Semana de Investigación or Research Week, we started about two years ago with this new format. So um, last year we opened with a conference by Richard Rogers about quantitative methodologies. So we say this year we need an expert in qualitative methodology. So the idea is to start with this conference by Sarah Ping, who I'm going to introduce her in a few seconds. Um, please remember, that, um, well, you already know, most of the people that's participating, we started last week with different courses. Um, today, after this uh, conference, we have a, a session, um, is the Activita Formativa 4, it's about the PhD thesis. And in the afternoon here in Barcelona and the rest of the week, we have many activities. We have more courses and seminars. And in the morning, we have different round tables and more activities, activities formativas regarding the presentation of uh, PhD researches. So people who is finishing the PhD this year or next year, they're sharing their experience with the rest of the group. And also we have the Experiencias de Movilidad, that's a round table about the people who has gone abroad, fortunate people that <laughs> went abroad in the last uh, year. And um, we hope we can go back to this kind of activity soon. And uh, well, you already know we have a lot of activities this week. So I'm going to introduce Sarah Ping. She's now in Australia. We, we found more or less a common time. So she, she's not going to sleep uh, very, very late. Um, Sarah now is in, in Melbourne, she's in Monash University, and I'm going to introduce her. Sara is director of the Emerging Technologies Research Lab in Monash University. Her research focuses on emerging intelligent technologies, automation, data, digital futures, safety, and design for well-being. Current projects investigate future automated mobilities, digital energy futures, self-tracking, and wearable technologies, smartphone and personal technology futures, digital technology use in everyday life, and healthcare design. I love this concept of future in the middle of this paragraph. I'm sure we have to talk a lot about the future, no future maybe that we have right now, but I think the idea of combining anthropology, ethnography, and future is very, very, and design is fantastic. Sarah is a world leading design anthropologist she has over 20 years of experience working with academic and industry research partners. And frequently, she gives keynotes and public lectures in academic and business environments internationally. She has published a lot of books, including Doing Visual Ethnography, which will be published in the fourth edition in 2021. Her last books, I, 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 I just found the last one, but there are so many books if you check for the production <laughs> Sarah is incredible. A digital ethnography principle for practice, 2015. Digital materialities, design anthropology. A book written with our friends Elisenda Devil and Deborah Lanceni in, in 2016. Anthropologies and futures with Juan Salazar, Andrew Irving, and Johannes Hover in 2017. Uncertainty and possibility: new approaches to future making in design with Yoko Akama and Shanti Sumatoko, 2018. And the, the last one in this list is 2019, Imagine Personal Data Experiences of Self-Tracking with Blake Force, Martin Berg, and Thomas Odell. Sarah has participated also in our H2020 Transliter Transmedia Literacy Project between 2015 and 18. And today, Sarah will talk about ethnography for a war in crisis. So Sara, thanks for your for accepting this uh, invitation. For, for us, it's a great pleasure to you are here and sharing your knowledge. So please go ahead. You can start sharing your presentation. Um, later, we have time for discussion, questions, and comment. Thanks. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Carlos. And I'm just really delighted to be here and to be able to speak to you. I wish I was in Barcelona 
or that the world enabled me to be in Barcelona at least at the moment, but I'm not, so um, I'll be addressing you from my home here in Melbourne. Okay, so um, can you see my screen? Have I shared my screen? With oh no, and this is the first time I've ever used this platform. So uh, we don't I guess see the presentation. You... Eh? We don't see it. Oh, no. uh, it's arriving now. Yes. Oh my God, that's the future. Yeah. So I thought that I would, um, as I'm talking about a world in crisis, I would start with a, a dramatic image. Um, <laughs> so this is just one of our little thunderstorms that we have here in Melbourne sometimes. Um, but, you know, I think my, my my point of giving this talk about eth ethnography for a world in crisis and starting with a dramatic image is because I think we are at a moment where for many reasons we need to rethink how we work as social scientists. And I think we need to make kind of a, if you like, slightly dramatic break from the way that we've always worked in the past, which means we need to think differently theoretically and conceptually, and we need to think differently methodologically, which, and by that, I mean, we need to confront futures in a way that we haven't in the past. Now, the reason, why do we need to do that? Well. I think partly because we are in a world in crisis and as social scientists, we have so much knowledge, so much expertise. And I think we have a responsibility to try to use that to intervene in the world as it moves forward. I know that many of us have been doing applied research for a really long time, but the social science disciplines have a problem. Well, I think have a problem traditionally in terms of our temporality, because we tended to always focus on what's happening in the present or what's happened in the past and to write about that, to only write about or do um, study what's observable, what has happened or what is happening. Now, in a sense, we're quite unusual because other disciplines such as design, economics, engineering, etc., people who work in those academic disciplines seem to have very little problem in determining what they think should happen next and also predicting what's going to happen next and intervening in the future. And if we don't join them and collaborate with them and move into the same space that they're in, although taking, of course, our ethical and theoretical principles with us, um, we're not going to be able to have as much impact as we ought to be having in the future space. We're not going to have the impact we need to have in terms of what's, what should happen next, what might happen next, or possible futures, as I like to say. So I think there's a really important reason why we need to start thinking about how we can enable the social sciences, which includes um, media and communication studies and all of the disciplines that participate in that field, um, like sociology, anthropology, cultural studies, human geography, all of those areas that kind of um, kind of pivot around the theory and practice of um, media, media and communication studies and, and these fields, which kind of overlap with each other in many ways. So I think we really need to have a push to kind of to move forward in new ways whilst still maintaining all of the important and, and good work that we have in our disciplines and subdisciplines already and our interdisciplinary fields already. Now I'm going to talk, I'm going to start, and also of course we're in this crisis moment now where we can see the future that we had expected just vanishing in front of us. It's not the first time this has happened. Um, in fact, one of my the anecdotes I often mention when I, I talk about this idea that you know, the future has always been uncertain, we just don't know until it reveals itself to be, um, is actually when I, I just moved to Australia and my friend invited me, I was in Madrid and my friend invited me to give a talk um, at her university in Madrid about futures. And um, it was the moment of um, during the economic crisis and the students that we talked to there kind of said really that they felt that their futures had been taken away from them. And it wasn't that their futures had been taken away. It's just that what we all anticipated our futures would be hadn't emerged as we expected them to. Those futures didn't exist already. Um, and I think right now that uncertainty about what's going to happen next that is brought forth the experience of having everything you expected to happen next disrupted really makes us realize that it's not just in our lives that these things are happening but also we need to think about the impl their implications for our, our research our practice as researchers so now i'm going to just tell you a, a little story about a research um, research projects um this is um february this year 
And with a, a research team, um, there were four of us, um, five of us in the team, four of us who went off to the research. We went off to um, New South Wales, rural, as you can see, New South Wales in Australia. We had to fly there um, through thunderstorms and, and it was quite dramatic, even you know, reaching this place at all because of all, they'd been flooding the, the days before we arrived there. The weather was terrible. Anyway, we, we got there to New South Wales and the research project we were doing there is a project which I have a report um, published soon and, and a film actually, which is called, um, which is about smart home technologies for older people. And um, we were doing research in an experimental project in a sense, and that we were doing research around how a, a group of older families, older people, um, were using smart home technologies which had been put into their houses for them to use and to trial. So it was an experimental project and that we, we were actually studying how they engaged with those technologies and how they learned to use them and, and how those technologies enabled them to generate a sense of independence and well-being. Now, when we, we got there then, and um, as it is when you do um, ethnography, when I do ethnography in homes, um, we were in these rich material environments of people's homes where they had their smart home technologies, but also the lifetimes, whole, for whole lifetimes of things that had been collected. And then, you know, I video recorded these people's stories as they, of, of using the technologies as they told them, so did my colleagues. There I am in the mirror with the camera with Melissa Duque, who's in the middle, and one of our research participants um, standing next to her as well. So this kind of rich materiality of people's everyday lives in their homes is, and, and the way in which we can participate in people's lives and, and speak to them and really get to know them is so fundamental to qualitative research and particularly to ethnographic research. Actually being there in their living rooms and here, um, we can see them using a um, automated vacuum cleaner and, and talking about it. Um, but the whole feeling of actually being in a home, and especially older people's homes, where as you can see, there's a lifetime of, of books and ornaments and, and the comfort that people at that age you know, really wish to experience in, in their homes. And there's also the joy and the fun of actually experimenting with people with the new technologies they're using. Now, this picture is when this participant, Bob, was using the Google Home device and he was he was talking to it, experimenting with some commands on it. And and just we were, we were having fun. And you can actually that sense of happiness and emotion and empathy that you feel when you're in, in people's homes with them, when you're doing qualitative research, is just so rich. And it's so important as this um, lady, Edna, um, Part of our research was also about how people experienced um, automated media content. And um, in this picture, she stands and listens to um, some music that she'd asked Google Home to play for her. And you can see how happy she looked and how happy our, our other participants looked equally happy when they showed us how they used their devices, how they accessed music. And we heard the music with them. And you find yourself in a magical moment in somebody else's life as they guide you around it. So we did this amazing research, this amazing field work, video recording people as they showed us around their homes, um, listening to their homes with them, um, sensing being in their homes. They gave us biscuits. Um, they gave us cups of tea. They were kind to us. So, you know, this this kind of way of um, of doing research is, is just so important. So we then as the, the pandemic was starting and we we traveled we traveled back then to Melbourne we flew back to Melbourne from Sydney to our big familiar city and um, things are just starting to change a little bit but we went back this is a research lab where we work and um, some of the people actually who I mentioned to work on the projects we we spent our time there um, very quickly this reality where we went off and did our field work and flew back to our city and came to work in our lab very quickly started to disappear. And we needed then to think quite differently about how we were going to do qualitative research because our project didn't just involve one trip to meet these older people. It actually involved us all flying back again a few weeks later to catch up with them, 
to ask them how they got on with their technologies, to explore their experiences of their technologies with them again, to see how they used them again, to listen to the ways they engaged with um, Google Home and the music and the, the other devices, um, to actually be there with them. And in fact, this was going to be a very significant stage, stage of our research. I was also going to return with a documentary filmmaker who was going to work with me to make a film. Um, in the end, we brought back with us quite a lot of video footage, um, a lot of um, audio recorded interviews and materials that we transcribed, and some very, very wonderful experiences. Um, and, and it's very lucky that we did, because a few weeks later, when we were doing the second stage of the research, then here's Melissa. Um, um, talk, this is a still from the film that we'll be releasing soon. Melissa was calling them up because we couldn't go anywhere. We were still allowed to go into each other's homes at that point. We were allowed to do that. So we could actually work together as a team. And I filmed Melissa as she called up the participants. Um, we actually, interestingly, we used the research for our research. We used one of the devices that one of the that the participants had been given because they'd been given tablets that they could use and they'd been using to call their families and speak to their families on video calls during the the pandemic we were actually able to use those same technologies um, to contact them and to continue the second part of our field work online now because we'd already been there we already had a sense of what it was like so so this picture of Edna in her living room, this is the chair she sat in when we sat in her living room on the sofa next to it. This is her usual chair that she always sat in to, um, to get on with her activities that she did at home. Um, it wasn't quite like being there, but it really invoked that feeling of being there. We knew where she was sitting. We knew where we'd sat. Um, and we... We filmed, we continued, I continued to film, as you can see in that image in the corner of the screen, we continued to speak to her. Um, and she turned the tablet around so we could speak to Bob, who you saw in the other picture. Um, he was sitting in his usual chair, the chair that he'd sat in when we'd visited. And um, we caught up with him as well. So um, this research project then, qualitative ethnographic project we had to adapt it very quickly from being one thing to being something quite different to what we'd expected so we went from you know experiencing these sensory affordances of visiting older people in their homes having drinking tea with them eating their wonderful biscuits that they made and offered us listening to their music with them just being in their homes and their lives their evolving and, and part being part of their evolving and learning relationships with smart home technologies we made the videos with them as we explored their homes. Um, we shared the videos and experiences across the research teams and we, we discussed you know, the experiences we've had and what had happened. And then our return visits happened with the video calls, the phone calls. We had all these experiences of being that we took with us. Um, so we kind of combined these face-to-face -face and digital ways of knowing and being with older people in this research project. We captured this sense of the pandemic with them because we were experiencing it at the same time. And, um, and not just with them, you know, with their animals. They had cats and, and dogs, they had dogs, um, they had birds and one family. Um, kind of researching this world with these people, with their cats and dogs, the other species and their technologies, as all of our lives changed at the same time. So at this moment, the research about the technologies and people actually was also research about the pandemic, research about living in the pandemic, research about being in crisis while we were in crisis ourselves. There is a phrase that some anthropologists have commented. Um, I don't know who said it, but um, actually an anthropologist is someone who's in crisis because they're suffering usually from culture shock, um, doing research about other people in crisis. And in this case, it rings particularly true. So it involved us really being being flexible and being open. And when we do research in crisis, ethnography for a world in crisis, definitely, certainly one of the key principles is being flexible and being open. I know that at the beginning of the crisis, um, I was involved in, in one at least one, one event in particular at Stanford University where we talked about distance ethnography. And I, I know that peop some people have found it very difficult to... Um, to conceptualise how to do ethnography if the plans that they had had changed so dramatically. Um, 
and I think that one of the things that we need to underpin our training now as we're in a world in crisis we've experienced a pandemic I know in Europe you're going back into lockdowns um, but it's not just about the pandemic in Australia we had before the the um, pandemic then we had the bushfires um, we're in an environmental crisis as well uh, we didn't go out very much when our cities were full of smoke um, people actually started to wear masks and the idea of wearing a mask felt so strange then um, whereas suddenly now it feels so normal because we're not allowed to go out if we don't wear them anyway now um, so it's not just a global health pandemic we might have to adapt to we might be adapting to our countries being literally on fire we might be adapting to 50 degrees in the summer so we need to think about how we're going to continue if that environmental crisis really does make our lives um, complicated in that way. So doing ethnography in a world in crisis or ethnography for a world in crisis means being flexible. It means being open to thinking differently and to doing differently. It means developing research approaches and methods that we can actually quickly mobilize in times of crisis. So we can just move across to our other methods, to the methods that do things not better, not worse, but differently when we're at a time of crisis, because we're researching in crisis and we're researching with crisis and we're researching with people who are also in crisis. Um, it's about these different modes of being which translate over from life to research, from research to life. We need to reflexively consider where we are positioned in worlds of crisis as researchers and as people. Um, reflexivity is a core um, part of ethnographic practice. This is something we need to apply that reflexivity to. We also reflexively need to comprehend both researchers and participants equally implicated in these worlds of crisis. We're moving forward, we're learning together and collaboratively. We're learning how to do research online with research participants. We're learning how to be participants online. We're learning how to do research in a crisis with people who are actually learning how to do research with us and to collaborate with us. In crisis as well. But we also can engage theory from media studies and digital anthropology to help us with this. We can also we'll end up developing new theories and new concepts. Now I really like that conceptual level um, where we can actually work with ideas like digital intimacy, digital materiality. Carlos mentioned the book that I edited with Alessandra Ardevol and Deborah Lanceni um, about digital materiality. That's the concept that we use to actually understand that relationship between the digital and the material. We've got the concept of the digital wayfarer, whereby we can understand how people actually weave their ways through the online offline world. Um, the idea of digital intimacy, how do we actually feel close to people using digital technologies and platforms? Um, the idea of digital futures, how can we actually understand um, the digital as something we're moving on to in a kind of uncertain and and possible future and how how that's um, a particular way of understanding that the digital is part of the way we move forward. Um, we also need to consider how emerging technologies and media, those things that are not yet ubiquitous in our everyday life, both as research topics and research probes, because they enable us to think about future possibilities in ways that are open, in ways that are flexible, um, rather than thinking about how we might uh, thinking about futures as they're predicted. So we need to be open and flexible, not just new methods, new techniques, but to actually thinking about the temporalities that, that we do research in and how the future is an uncertain space that's not necessarily knowable, but that can be work researched as a possibility. Um, and we also need to be open and flexible in terms of shifting our temporality by seeing the future as a research site. As I said before, to research uncertainties, possibilities, imaginaries, visions, and more, those spaces that don't exist yet. So to think about how can we do our research, not only in online and in offline, but how can we do research in, in spaces and situations and circumstances that don't actually exist, that actually haven't happened and are not happening during the, the time of our research. Um, and, and use the idea of crisis as a way of opening up that uncertainty about what's going to happen next and acknowledging that we need to research those sites of uncertainty. So 
What I'm getting at, and what I mentioned at the beginning, I've got this whole slide in red because I think it's something that I want to stand out, is this idea of changing the temporalities of the social sciences and humanities. So from the past to the future. And also, especially for me speaking as an anthropologist, we've always situated our work in the past, specifically because we have an ethical kind of urge to do that. Um, because if we, 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 for us ethically, we shouldn't be crystallizing our research um, participants and their lives and worlds in the present. The ethnographic present is a problematic tense because it objectifies people and things and processes and worlds. Um, so to respect the people we do our research with, we've always written about the past, about what has happened, um, but not expecting that to always continue to be the, um, the case as we move on into the present, and the, you know, the, the present as it, the continuous present as it moves forward, and the continued changing present. So um, we have an interesting challenge there, and how do we write about the future? How do we write about things that have not yet happened without objectifying them? Importantly, I think we need to think about this idea of the present slipping over into the past. So something that's happened in the present as being always been something that has happened to actually working in a different mode, in a different temporality to rather than working backwards to work forwards. So why don't we think about the present that we're doing research in right now as always slipping over into the future and, and take that as our kind of way of feeling what the research process feels like. So not always collecting things that are always going to be about what hasn't, what's already happened, but actually creating things which are about what hasn't happened yet, or maybe will never happen, what, what could happen, that possibility. Now, the reason why I think we need to do this is because I think that focusing on the possible, on this present slipping over into the future, into the what hasn't happened and what might not happen, but which could happen, um, enables us to complicate predictive future visions because predictive future visions talk about what will happen. Um, they might more realistically think about talk about what should happen. Um, but we can complicate those by bringing uncertainty into the vision. And why do we need to do this? Because, as I said before, we need to play in the future space. We need to, as social scientists, we need to play in that space. We need to be players in that space. We need to try to have influence in that space. We need to engage in it. And importantly, we need to collaborate in that space. It's not so much a game to play, but a space in which we should become implicated and co-implicated with those other disciplines who are working in it. So how did I get there? Well, for me, one of the core areas, as I said, I'm an anthropologist, is, is building on what I call futures anthropology. And the book Anthropologies and Futures and the European Association of Social Anthropologists, Future Anthropologies Network that I founded with Juan Salazar is, this, is a starting point for a lot of this. Now, I'm not going to go into theory in depth, but the idea for our network and, and for me as well, um, my work drawing on, on the network's kind of commitments are that I see futures as uncertain, as always emerging. They, ne they never stop. It's part of that ongoingness of, of life itself. They're to do with possibility, not predictability. They're sensed and they're felt, which means that the future is not just something we talk about. The way in which we um, experience possible futures is sensory. It's emotional. It's effective. It's about how we can actually feel what it might be like to be in a different situation as we move forward. Um, you can all think of examples of that from your everyday life. I mean, one of my favorite ones is when I was a long time ago, I was planning a house renovation and I would walk around the house imagining what it would be like when I changed it. But it wasn't something that I found it easy to talk about. Um, it was something that I would feel and sense and I could almost see it, I could almost feel what it was like, but to describe it was difficult. And, and that's why we, we work with architects and designers who, who have ways in which to try to create interventions into futures. Now, the other thing that I do in to research futures is to think about concepts. I talked about concepts earlier. Um, these concepts uh, of trust, anxiety, hope and desire are four anticipatory concepts which I find are really important for researching futures. They all have different kind of distances into the future 
about different moments and they actually all surface in, in different ways and um, are part of different experiences, but they're all anticipatory modes of being. Trust is a great one when we think about, um, trust is a near future concept and it's that feeling of going forward with confidence, with familiarity, without feeling a sense of anxiety. We can't help going forward because the world is always going forward. We can't stop it, but trust is when we feel that we're going forward in a way that's comfortable. Um, so what I'm interested in then is complicating the vision, a social science that can respond to crisis. Now, I've talk, I mentioned already the environmental crisis, the bushfires, the public health crisis, um, the economic crisis, which is ensuing, particularly in relation to the public health crisis that's we've been all over the place for a long time, and political crisis across the world, one of which I think has started to be resolved to some extent in the last 24 or so hours. But I would still say that there is a lot of political crisis in the world. Um, now, another, so, so that's part of the, the crisis context. That's what we need to respond to. But there's another thing we need to respond to because emerging technologies, which is one of the core aspects of my research. So we might think about AI, automated decision making, uh, machine learning, um, big data analytics and predictive analytics. They're all aspects of it and they become manifested in things like self-driving cars, um, robotic um, technologies for all kinds of things that might be used in the world in health or in everyday life. Um, or various uses for drones. And so all kinds of technologies they become manifested in. Um, but they're starting to also, there are also predictions about how emerging technologies are going to participate in a, a world that's more automated and more data driven. And um, I think these are particularly the visions that we need to complicate. These are dominant visions that assume that technological innovation can actually solve societal problems. Now, as a social scientist, I, of course, find that quite problematic because all of our research in the social sciences indicates that the visions that technologies can solve societal problems are usually on false assumptions because they usually do not account for how people complicate futures. So we need new theoretical and methodological approaches um, to work in this space. But we also need to maybe rethink our roles as academics at these times. Now, that's not to say that there are not a lot of good academics doing amazing applied research. And I know that Carlos is, is amongst them from the project that we were involved in together. Then. Um, but I think there's something else that needs to happen now. I think that we need a bigger perspective on that, a bigger movement towards that which responds to this question of how can we participate in researching, creating insights about and shaping better futures by specifically engaging with this idea of future, this idea of uncertainty and the idea of crisis. So that's what I've been thinking about for probably the last couple of years, but <coughs> maybe more intensely recently. Now, Carlos mentioned my um, book doing visual ethnography it's going into its fourth edition now it's in it's in production at the moment it should be published at the beginning of next year and this in terms of methodology instead of writing a new book about future focused methodology um the thing that i really wanted to do was to revise this book so i first wrote this book 20 years ago and um in the first edition and I had absolutely no idea. I was, I was quite relieved when I finished it because I thought it was dreadful. And um, I was just thought, oh, well, at least nobody will ever read it because um, by the time I'd finished writing such a lot, you know, I, really, I really didn't think that very much of it at all. So I, I'm continually surprised by the number of people who have um, bought it and read it and the fact that it's going into its fourth edition. But um, I do have a lot more confidence in the book as well because of its trajectory. And this, for me, is the biggest revision I've made of it. And the idea for me that was really exciting that I could actually revise visual ethnography as a future focused visual ethnography because the use of visual um, technologies and media, mainly for me, photography and video, but also drawing and comic strips and all kind of methods we've developed in various projects recently, um, have been to me so fundamental in the work that I've done and in the kind of ability of video and photography to surface those things in qualitative research processes that we would never usually notice. 
So for me, the idea of, of adapting and pushing that on into a future focus visual ethnography, which I have been practicing in, in my recent projects anyway, was really exciting. So how do we, so starting to think then about how do we uncover everyday future imaginaries and senses, those feelings as we move towards the future using visual methods? Um, how do we actually use everyday visualities to disrupt visions of predictive futures? And I'll show an image that represents that that's really fun and a bit. Um, how do we create possible future visions through speculative documentary? So um, there's some excellent work in, in that book. Um, which I write about um, by Juan Salazar and also by Johanna Schoberg, who were both co-editors co of the um, Anthropologies and Futures book. So Juan's speculative documentary filmmaking is about um, Antarctic futures and Johanna's um, um, futures focused um, filmmaking um, is about environmental change and crisis. And he actually goes through kind of a series of future stories about a guy who he starts um, in the film with when he's a late teenager and then takes him up until he becomes significantly older in the film so that both of those films are absolutely amazing amazing um as speculative um anthropological ethnographic documentary films um so there's some really exciting work going on in this space um and some of that is also interventionist visual ethnographies which seeks to reshape our futures and i've de been developing my own practice of um, design ethnographic filmmaking as well, which I, I found a really exciting way in which also to think about futures. So let's have a look then at some of this work. Now, um, a lot of my work has been about future mobilities. And I'll just give a couple of examples here because I think these are quite fun. And this is also about what the visual can do. So this is a future vision of a self-driving car. And I have an article which we use this image in with Thomas Lindgren and, and Vika Fors from um, Sweden, who I've been working with. And um, what was brilliant about this is that this is a lovely, clean image, a future, predictive kind of future image of these women having a business meeting in a very lovely, beautiful, clean self-driving car. Um, but we've been doing research about what um, cars are really like. And what we found is that people have an awful lot of stuff in their cars. And um, what's interesting then about doing this research in the present and then trying to imagine with people how they could potentially kind of relinquish all of these things they have in their car and the implications that would have for the way in which they need to use their cars in their everyday life context. For example, this is a map of a car um, with all of the things that people keep in them. Um, which is incredibly different from the clean visions of future cars. Cars in the present are really messy very often. So aren't future cars going to be similar? Has something not been forgotten in the way that futures are envisaged and imagined? So this is another of our projects, Digital Energy Futures. And in this project, the task that we performed, well, the first task we performed in the project and our team was an analysis of over 60 reports by the energy and industry, industry, energy and technology industries um, about how they envisaged the future. And what we did to them, and specifically um, Kerry Dahlgren, who's one of the, the research fellow in our team did, is that Kerry developed a series of comic strips. Now, the comic strips don't represent what we think is going to happen in the future. The comic strips represent what the reports claimed, collectively claimed, the future would be like. Now, by visualizing this, then we were able to create a speculative future, well, a future scenario that represented the predictions um, of the industry, which we thought was a fascinating way in which to present this to our research participants. Now, in our pilot study, Kerry here is actually looking with one of the participants at the comic strips. And we, we use those to enable the participants to then talk to, us, talk to us about how they can imagine if their real future lives will actually fit into those industry visions, um, which has been a really exciting way to actually get research participants to, to engage with possible futures and consider their own possible futures in relation to them. Now, this project and our pilot, this is our pilot study that the picture is of. Of course, the pandemic started, and, and this is actually how um, we did the research. There I am sitting at my the same same place where I'm sitting now, actually, um, doing our home. So we've done everything for this project online, um, our interviews, 
our home video tours, our participants have sent us some amazing research materials. So we've been enabled to also flexibly and rapidly adapt that project to gaining an understanding of what's uh, of our participants' lives instead of doing the home visits and videos as we planned. There's one of the participants talking to me. That's what our field work sites look like sometimes. And this comic strip has actually been one of my favourites because this is the first scenario. Now, this is what um, the future was predicted to be like by the reports that we analysed. What's been fascinating about this is that actually for some of our participants, this is not the future at all. Um, this is actually what their lives have been like the pandemic. So I think that um, doing research during this period of crisis has also changed people. It's enabled them to kind of see their lives differently and also some of the shifts in the way people have been living have almost, I wouldn't, I would definitely not say have taken them into a future, but have enabled them to identify with predicted future scenarios in ways we'd never have expected. It's been able them to comment on these scenarios and imagine their own futures again in ways we would never have realised or expected before we started this project. So, um, research in a world in crisis also is capable of revealing insights we would never have had access to before. And I think that our visual methods in doing this have been very effective. Now, before finish I just want to take you into some more researcher methods and approaches that enable us to research things that have not happened and um, which represent possible futures. Now um, I'm sorry if anybody's been in my talk before you might have seen this slide because I still show it because I absolutely love it. difficult to guess what it is but I won't I won't do that now but this slide um, is not what it seems. So this place is not what it seems. So the shop fronts are from the US and they're in dollars. You can see there's some roads and like around a block. Um, and then you can see the woods in the background, which are actually the Swedish woods, the Swedish woods. And we've got the US shop fronts. And then if you look at the top of that building, you can see that it's actually empty, an empty shell. So this is a test site where um, it's an automotive testing site and it's one of the sites where self-driving cars are tested. Now what we've been doing then are projects in Sweden, which I collaborate with my colleagues at Humpstead University and Volvo Cars to do this work. We've been doing Wizard of Oz testing. Now Wizard of Oz testing entails um, a car being adapted um, with technologies that enable it to be actually driven by a safety driver while the person driving, who thinks they're driving a car, who is a research participant, thinks that they're driving it themselves. So it creates a scenario then, which is of a possible future. So this kind of test, the research participant is actually able to experience a possible future um, or a situation that could never actually happen in the present. It might not be a future, but we can, we can call it of a possible future. So we've been using these not only on test sites, but also um, our, the researchers and our team have been doing research with people using these cars in their everyday life context, where they've been given quite advanced self-driving cars, which they think are driving themselves, but the test driver is, the driver is actually doing that. So it enables them to experiences that they could never normally have in their everyday life, and to reflect on those experiences and how they felt which is a way of sensing possible futures, possible futures and being like in the possible future in a very kind of visceral and sensory and emotional way because they're responding to what they thought was a, a future, a car that could not exist in the present. Um, going back to the trial of the smart home technology, um, I just come back to that quickly because in a sense, this is a similar principle. So the people who participated in the project would never have used or experienced the technologies or the media content that they were delivered through them, um, or communication possibilities they experienced through them, um, if they had not participated in the smart home trial. Now I'm not saying we launched these older people into a future, but we created a situation where they were actually able to experience a possibility that would never have occurred in their everyday present. So the point is, is that we, we're researching 
possibilities. And when we're contemplating uncertain futures then, um, researching possibilities is a really exciting process. Um, and also researching how possibilities will feel. So this is a future focused approach to media studies, digital anthropology, and it, it's not about seeking to predict what's going to happen in the future by seeing how people engage with possibilities. It's about understanding how life might move forward as new technologies, media content and communication become part of lives. It's here where we can complicate future visions that predict, for example, that older people's lives will be changed by emerging technologies in particular ways by actually from our perspective, engaging with older people as they learn how to use these emerging technologies and complicating those future visions by saying, no, this is actually what has happened and what could happen in these possible situations. So again, the listening to music, the being online with us, these are all things that would never have happened if we hadn't created that research context. Sorry, Sarah, your camera is yeah. off. Turn your camera oh. on, please. <laughs> <laughs> when did it just go off now? Turn the camera on in the icon. Click on the icon ah. below. Just the camera. Just a minute. I'm going to have to end the screen share. Go back. You have the microphone and the camera. And that's, uh, oh, yeah, somehow. I must have touched something. <laughs> And I accidentally switched it off. Okay, and then we'll get back. To... Here we are, perfect. Okay, go okay. ahead. So can you see my... Um... Yeah, perfect, perfect, go ahead. Great. I can see you. Good. Okay, so, okay, perfect, yes. What? So this is like my almost last slide. And um, this is just a visualization then of where I am in this um, and where I see how I see that movement how I see this convergence in the middle so on the one side we've got the academics some and I've said not all I'm social scientists but I think the dominant traditional version is to academic to search for academic research knowledge to develop theory to develop a bigger comparative picture um, but and to and to work with research participants in this kind of conventional research space to study research participants and and in that research kind of tradition well academics are a little bit worried about discussing futures because we would always say oh but we can't we don't know what's going to happen in the future we can't predict it and nobody should predict it um and then on the other side we've got the stakeholders which i would include some academic disciplines in as well who the industry partners, technology designers, who, who might be academics, might be engineers, might be computer scientists, policy makers, for example, cities, working on, on city policy, maybe urban planning and that kind of thing, consumer associations, who very much more tend towards looking at quantitative future predictions, using them to inform policy, um, using them as part of the technology design process, using them as ways to actually determine where to invest them. Um, the, in where to, how to make their future investments in developing their businesses or in the energy industry, which we're looking at in our energy futures project in, in infrastructure investments. Now, in those areas, they tend to talk about people, our users, consumers and citizens. So we've got this situation where um, now in, for me as an anthropologist, as a design ethnographer, I also deal with um, the common bit is the red bit, the people. OK, because I do research about people with complex everyday lives and they might be people who are research participants. They might be the people who the stakeholders think are users, consumers and citizens. But actually, you're never just a user, you're never just a consumer, you're never just a citizen and you're never just a research participant. Everybody, people, always people with complex everyday lives. They can never just be one thing. Um, so for me, that's the core in understanding people. Um, and I want to produce ethnographic insights and materials, um, and I'll take a design anthropology, ethnography or anthropology approach. But the idea is that within that as well, I want to create non-predictive qualitative futures. So to look at that realm of possibility, um, to think about those possible futures as plausible futures, as possibly realistic futures, but never predictive. Um, 
And never something I'm worried about talking about, never something I think is too problematic to be able to talk about. So that's where I kind of situate that the work that I want to push forward in, in that zone, which draws on the other areas and it respects them and it collaborates with them, but it has a particular way through. Um, now finally, oops, oh no, there's something, <laughs> there's something missing in the middle here, which um, is one of the pictures, um, which is really bizarre. There should be a picture in the middle, which is of lots of people, because the point, the whole point of this slide is just to say that none of this work is work I've done on my own. Um, all of my work is, is collaborative and shared, and I work with absolutely fantastic teams of people. And the picture that's meant to be right in the middle of this slide has got about 20 people in it. So I want to acknowledge those people and those projects and those collaborations across the world and across our different universities and to make it very clear that I also believe that the way forward for us is team research and team ethnography. I know Carlos works in great teams as well. We worked, had an enormous team for the project we collaborated in. But um, a lot of research in the social sciences and humanities is done by the lone researcher, and um, which is also important, but I think there's a very big case for also moving beyond that, thinking about how we work in teams. So back to the crisis, but that's not quite the end because I just wanted to reiterate that for me, the bigger question there is changing the temporalities of the social sciences and humanities, this from the past to the future, from the present slipping over into the past to the present slipping over into the future. I like to think of us as standing always at the edge of the, the edge of the future, just tipping over into it. And hopefully we don't fall into it, we step over with confidence. Um, to complicate the predictive future visions and to play in this field. And then hopefully our future won't, won't look like the thunderstorm, look a little bit more like the, um, the coastline of the, the west of Sweden in the summer. So thank you very much, that's where I'd like to end. Okay, thank you very much, Sara. Thanks for all these beautiful, great ideas. Uh, well, there are so many things here. There's a lot of food for thought in your presentation, and I really enjoy it. Um, you gave us a lot of beautiful ideas and also beautiful tweets, I guess. I have a couple of them here. But this idea of considering future as a research site is incredible. It's disruptive, especially in media studies. Um, I don't have a lot of time to explain what, but just a little thing is that um, social sciences, and you explained that. Um, let's go back. Let's go back to the origins of scientific knowledge. Prediction was a key element of scientific knowledge, you know, in physics, astronomy. So to be scientific, you should be able to predict. When we move to biology, thanks to Darwin, we know that it's very difficult to predict the evolution. It's impossible to predict the evolution. We don't know the different combinations, mutations, variations. And in social science, we have, for the last 100 years in media study, we have been constrained to predict the effects of media. That was the big business in media studies, ah, to predict the effects of television <laughs> on children, to predict the effects of video games on uh, teenagers and adult people also now. So, mm -hmm. but that's impossible to predict that. So if we moved from the idea of quantitative prediction to a non-predictive qualitative approach, I think this uh, that's a revolution for us in that sense, because mm -hmm. we must think in the future um, it's good to study the past and what's going on today, but in, 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 the, in this context, it's strategic to, to think the future. So this idea of moving from the traditional predictive model that in media studies, especially, we have been under pressure for the last 100 years, I think it's a great, great idea, contribution for us. I don't know, do we have any questions right now? Let me check the chat. You can raise your hands, you know, the, in Collaborate, you can do that. Carlos Olesewan has a question. Okay. Yes. A question. Okay. Come on. 
I don't know if we, we should habilitate him or... No, I think that he can open the micro. Sorry. Oh, he should open the micro. Yeah. yeah. For a second, click on your microphone and go ahead. Hola, 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 second. Can you talk? Okay. If you can't, or if you have any trouble, just write the question in the chat. Well, um, uh, Mon Rodriguez is saying the chat is not, doesn't work for you? That's not possible. Um, because He's connected by streaming. Ah, they have the other link. Oh my God. Yeah. What's up with me, please? Um, use WhatsApp with me. Someone else? People say that it's not, uh, the chat is not on. I don't understand that. What should we do here? And let me check. Yes, we can activate, but how do we activate the chat? Sorry for this problem. No problem. <laughs> okay, now you can share. Okay, now you can write on the chat. Okay. Yeah. I think you can do it right now. Okay, here we are. Okay. Sorry for the... Okay, I'm going to repeat Olusegun question. He's a PhD student in the Medium Research Group. He said, in your interview with Dr. Silvia Yanas Gisako of Stanford University, you talk about ethnographic sorry, hunch, the approach you often play with during your ethnographic research. My question is, would you advise doctor student to apply the same approach while conducting a research? And would that be considered as an unstructured ethnographic approach? This ethnographic hunch. Um, yes, I would recommend that anybody uses it. Um, and so I have, um, I mentioned the ethnographic hunch in the visual ethnography book, actually. Um, I also mention it in, I also have a chapter about it, a bigger piece about it in a book that will be coming out next year called The Ethnographic Effect, which is about analysis and ethnography, um, edited by a Danish, well, one of the colleagues um, is who edited it is Danish. And um, so that's, um, Yes, I mean, I, I think the ethnographic hunch is something that is not a technique that I invented. I think it's something that most anthropologists do. And most of us, we might not even realize that we're doing it. But I think that um, it very much depends on the disciplinary influences on your research. And also, I guess if you're a doctoral student, then you need to think about who your examiners are going to be and who you're writing to and how convincing you're going to be in terms of um, your account of your methodology. So it's all very contingent on um, on circumstances of your PhD, really. But I personally would, would recommend that this kind of practice of, process of, you know, experiencing a hunch and following it through your research process, that's where you find out the things that really matter. Because you can start your research thinking you know what you want to find out, and you'll find out the things you thought you wanted to find out, and, and they will be important and they will be interesting. But the things that you didn't know that you needed to know are usually the much more important things because they were never obvious to begin with. Um, those kind of hidden things that you you wouldn't you wouldn't you couldn't know about because you hadn't started the research. Okay, thank you. We have another question by Alicia Canellas. She said, what do you think about the possible use of the Delphi method, for example, with a panel of experts from key areas as an option to predict possible future trends or needs at a technological level? 
pros and cons. Delphi is very, very popular, I guess, in Spain. This idea of okay. me making a meeting with e experts. That's the question. Um, yeah, look, I think that... I think it's a useful and interesting method for building future scenarios, but I don't think it's very useful for predicting the future. I don't think anything's very useful for predicting the future, actually. Um, and I think we need to move beyond predictive approaches to approaches that account for uncertainties and consider possibilities. Now, that doesn't mean we can't try to think about plausible futures and that we can't work with economists and engineers and climate experts who can model possible futures and possible scenarios and put all of those together. But um, we, we really need to think about the kind of knowledge that is associated with futures as being possible. And, you know, uncertainty is a key concept in those sciences as well, when they're done properly and, and well. Um, I think the problem is the, um, the dependency on, on prediction and, and those, and the, you know, the hope that, that we have that predictions will play out. And when they don't, um, we know that those certainties, certainties cannot be depended on. And there's a reason why we're doing our Digital Energy Futures project, for example, because um, we're going to work with um, energy forecasters to actually complicate the kinds of visions of the future that they usually use with social science research findings about what people will possibly do in the future, because they know that if they don't complicate those future visions, then they are in danger of making the wrong future in, wrong investments, which could lead to the breakdown of an energy system, which could be really dangerous as temperatures get hotter and hotter. So, yeah, it's it's quite um, important, I think, to um, to think about getting it right in terms of how we try to predict futures or don't predict them. Thank you. We have another question by Jorge Caballero. He asks more information about the speculative documentary concept. You can say something more about that. I, I, yeah, I can. It very, very interesting. Yeah, it's, it's absolutely fascinating. So Juan's film is amazing. Um, and he writes about it in the Anthropologies and Futures books that I showed the slide of the cover for that book. So he has a chapter about it. And um, so in his film, he uses ethnographic documentaries that he shot in Antarctica. And um, he then combines that with a speculative future scenarios that he shot with uh, a Maori actress um, who who plays the role of um, a future scientist. So, um, yeah, it's it's a fantastic um, way of bringing together ethnographic research, which was actually done in situ in a particular place. Um, and also, of course, the, the use of Antarctica research, doing research there in itself is um, it's it's a, a project done in an extreme environment and extreme environments are also used as, as places to potentially kind of explore what, what might happen in other future extreme environments. So there's a whole load of layers of future going on there. So, so that's um, Juan's film. As I said, you can read about it. Um, and he also has, um, you can, if you look it up, it's called, um, oh no, what's it called? Um, oh, I can't remember, but it will come back to me. Um, the, but if you look up Juan, um, Juan Francisco Salazar, um, Western Sydney University, then you can find his profile and it's, it's all there. Um, and then the other film I talked about, Johannes Schoberg's film, is also super interesting um, because of the story he tells about this guy who keeps coming back into a phone box and, and phoning his future self to ask his future self what his life is like 10, 20, 30, or whatever years ahead. Um, so again, you know, a speculative kind of futures film that speculates about what the experienced future is going to be like and what somebody will tell their younger self um, about it as they look back. Um, but you know, so those are two models of kind of speculative futures filmmaking, which I think are fantastic. Um, and you know, that it's it's a it's a field ready to be explored. But I think the important thing to think about is that it's not just speculative documentary, it's, it's speculative kind of anthropological documentary filmmaking, which has been performed and created in a context where it actually does have these reference, you know, to, um, to the academic context that it's made in. Um, 
Yeah, so that's, for me, that is the future of anthropological or ethnographic filmmaking, and that's something I would just love to see much more of. Thank you, Sara. We have a question by Carlos Feisha from the Jobis Research Group. Uh, how do we can conduct field work on street cultures during pandemics with people with poor access to technologies? That's a problem. So people who can't access technologies or people who can? Because he talks about field work on street cultures. Uh, Carlos analyzed mm -hmm. uh, gangs and uh, young people in, in, in gang groups. And he asked, how do you analyze this street culture during pandemics? with people with low access to technology. To technologies. Yes, I think that um, that's, that's always a challenge. Um, but I guess the question becomes, well, if people have, don't have great access to technologies, then how do they communicate with others as well? So people still communicate and they still live in particular ways if they don't have smartphones or other digital technologies. So. I guess the question is, well, how might you communicate with them? Um, what other ways do they communicate with others? Um, and, and to explore that, I don't think there's a simple answer to that question. But we, I think something around that came up when we were doing the, um, the talk at Stanford as well. Um, there is a possibility of sending things to people and getting them to send things back to you. Um, they don't have to, it doesn't have to be any, even something written. I mean, there could be many ways in which to ask people to create things and, and to post them to you if you provide the technologies, um, to drop things off and pick things up to people, from people. Um, of course, if they're living over, you know, in a distant place, then that becomes more complicated, but then you might collaborate with local people to work um, with you. Don't always think of yourself as the kind of the grand researcher who connect, connects with the other people. Think of yourself as part of a network of people who want to collaborate to make sense of something together or to get somewhere together, to go on a journey together. So it shouldn't necessarily, you know, always just be you as a researcher who needs to kind of find the way to get to that person to get the information from them. So, yeah, I think there are there are ways to work with that. Um, and as I said, you're a person in crisis doing research with other people in a crisis. So how do we all live, learn to live and work together in that world? And that includes researching together. OK, thank you. We have so many questions. So we have one from Sheffield Hallam University by my friend Mom Rodriguez. The question arrived via WhatsApp. <laughs> so um, thanks a lot for your inspiring presentation, Professor Pink. Uh, how do you, if at all, incorporate digital data, online data, previous data, quantitative or network data or maps, or, and geolocative, geolocative data in your research? How you incorporate all this data in your research? I am aware there is a tension in the mode times construction here. But to what extent do you think that digital data complements, helps, or could ideally your work? Um, that's a really big question. So um, I think that kind of quantitative digital data, yes, of course, it's interesting. Um, um, I think the key thing is to be aware of what it can tell us and to think about how we might bring that together with quantitative, qualitative understandings. I mean, I, I don't necessarily have a, a direct example um, of that because I don't always work in such a way that I would bring together those materials myself, but we have been doing that in some projects. And um, I think that one thing is that the qualitative materials complicate the quantitative materials and data. So, you know, to give an example that, you know, if um, somebody is being tracked, um, and, and in my own work about self-tracking technologies and, and body data, for example, you know, you just because you've got that geolocational data for somebody, just because you know how many steps they've taken, just because you know how much they slept, um, you don't really know that much about them. You don't know how they felt. You don't know what they experienced. You don't know if they were really in the places that that data says they were in. And you don't really know if they took as many steps as the 
device or technology is actually saying that they took. So I think there's a there's a very important relationship between quantitative and quantitative data. I mean, quantitative data can also be something that's really interesting to get people to comment on in qualitative projects to see if they can explain it. Um, so I wrote an article called Broken Data with two of my colleagues, Minna Ruckensteiner and Robert Billen, um, where we actually looked at data and how data is never, you know, data is not complete. Data, digital data doesn't tell you a truth. It's never complete. It's never finished. It's never, you know, that discrete thing that it appears to me to be. It can be what we call broken. In, and often data scientists have to clean data, have to repair data before they can put it together to do analysis. So, um, Part of it is about actually understanding data as being something a little bit different from what we might expect it to be as well. So our article is called Broken Data. It's in um, Big Data and Society, if you want to have a look at that. OK, thank you. Oh, so, so many questions here. I, I, I try to put them together. We have a question that is connected to um, Sorry, 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 sorry. I start the game. We have a lot of questions. Sorry. So I'm going to try to connect a couple of them. So uh, because we will not have enough time for all for answering all the questions. So we have a question by jo Joanna Aziz. She says, if we are trying to imagine the future of academia, what is the way we can approach research that does not reproduce power dynamics, that has a history marginalizing disenfranchised groups? And this is one question, but it's connected to another one, is how can we recruit people for digital ethnography? How can we obtain the consent? That means how to sign uh, documents. And also, Fernanda Pires and myself, we, are, we want to ask the same question, because right now we are working with people working in, uh, in platforms, um, people working in a very flexible market. And on one side, we have to respect the protocols, getting the information and, and, and and preserve the privacy of these people. But at the same time, it's very complex to work with these people in these so marginal environments. So I think there's a connection between these three questions. How to work with people, how not to reproduce, exclude them from research, and how to deal with the protocols that we need to preserve the privacy, especially in these collectives. Thanks. We cannot hear Sarah, Carlos. We can hear you. No, just check the icon yeah. below. Yeah. I just got muted, so, but you can hear me now, yeah? Yeah, yeah, now we, we can hear you. <laughs> so, yeah, I think the, um, yeah, so I want to answer it in terms of futures to a certain extent, because I think what's important is that when we, when we see some of the dominant narratives um, about futures. Often those are referring to the futures of, you know, a few white men living in wealthy countries. And um, when we, what we really need to always ask is whose futures are we concerned with, and um, and how might we go about representing those futures which are marginalised, that are less visible, and also the possibilities. How do we go about creating and imagining um, possible futures that might be more appropriate? So I think that for me, visual ethnography is one of the ways I think about that, because if we can actually use the visual video um, and well, and audio, audio but photography and video and those methods to actually get under the surface of what life is really like and to complicate the future visions with the, the worlds of people whose futures and future, possible futures are not usually even thought about or looked at um, by the people who are in power or considered to be as important then we by making possible alternative possible futures visible i think we can play a really significant role there um now that's a bit abstract and of course it gets a lot more difficult yeah when you you have to try to find people who, who are willing to get on board with that with you um i think part of the key thing there to think about 
being collaborative. So it's a collaborative process and, and that's really important. Um, so how to engage other people in shifting those visions of the future? I mean, part of it, I think, is about showing people visions of the future and, and asking them where they where they sit in that future, how they can see themselves in that future. And there's a great study um, which I, I read, which is published in one of the, the journals, and I can't remember the name of the author. He has a Spanish name, though. Um, and um, it was a brilliant study where he asked um, people to photograph um, a neighbourhood of London and um, to and for, to photograph it in order to rep, in a way such a way that represented their concerns with the planning which had been made for the development of that area, um, and I thought that was just a marvelous example of how you can actually, if you ask people to envisage their futures or how or to visually show you how their futures will be impacted by dominant narratives, then you can make visible their concerns and they in, in new ways. So, getting that yeah consent when you're doing online work is is a different question, but everybody has a digital identity, so they should be able to use that digital identity to give consent. Um, we've been using online consent forms, um, which people access through their emails. Um, so that's one kind of option. Thank you very much. One more question by Pablo. The question is, uh, how to predict the future about the research of COVID-19 with the use of digital ethnography? Because the quantitative data of disease and people contagious are not a study about from a cultural perspective. We have data from Italy, Italian people, Spanish people, Peruvian people, but the people are they're very different. And um, they only study with the numbers. And so the idea is uh, um, they do not study in practical dairy group and cultural uses and performances. Do you think we need more digital stories of life about? Yeah, and I think a lot of people have been doing research about the experience of COVID. Um, I know that um, you know, Deborah Lupton, a um, very well-known sociologist here in Australia, and also Annette Markham, um, who's really well-known in internet studies, I know that they've both been involved in quite significant studies of what have been, people have been doing and how it's been happening in COVID and collecting stories. Um, my own one of my existing projects is a, a project that I'm involved in in the UK. It's an economic and social research council funded project there, and I'm there. I'm working with a professor of social work, who does a lot of research about child protection, social work, and the home visit. So we've been doing research about how social workers like research, and I, I've given a couple of talks about this in the last couple of weeks actually. And and I in those talks I've compared. You know, our experience as researchers as sudden, who do research in other people's homes are suddenly having to go online with the experience of social workers who usually go and visit children in her homes and families who then suddenly couldn't go in the homes to do their work. So our research has actually been ex about studying their experience of going online and having to do child protection, social work digitally from their homes using WhatsApp, using Zoom, so using their phones or their computers and, and how and using those concepts of digital intimacy and digital materiality and di digital wayfinding, et cetera, um, to try to understand some of their experiences. And I think that's the marvelous example of an applied media studies and, or applied digital anthropology approach. Um, and, and again, we are working with vulnerable people there as well, because the families who social workers work with are vulnerable um, and, and need you know, support through that process. Okay, thank you. We have a couple of questions. I think the last ones. Um, Judith Aston, she said, thanks, Sara. A, a very timely intervention. In order to embrace uncertainty, we need to accept it, which is battle for hearts and minds in itself. How do you yeah. negotiate this with research participants whose worldview is at odds with this? Does it matter? Does it even need to be negotiated in order to do the research? Hearts and minds. That's a wonderful. That's a wonderful question. Um, because I guess I haven't been in a situation where I've had to convince a research participant that their future is uncertain. Um, in that sense, um, I think what has been interesting is doing the research, particularly with the social workers. Um, whose lives were and their professional lives were completely disrupted and um, their uncertainty that we learned about as they adapted to this new situation where 
where they were actually confronting uncertainty on an everyday basis because they didn't know they didn't know if they could do their jobs properly. They didn't actually know what they knew when they were using digital technologies rather than being there in, in person. So um, I think in a sense, the work doing research doing and also our, our researchers in the Energy Futures Project, they'd all been through the pandemic as well. So I think in a sense, doing research in the pandemic um, brought that uncertainty to the surface. So it actually enabled us to do research with people when they were experiencing and acknowledging a deep sense of uncertainty. So it's been a very unique time in which to actually do research with people about their experiences of digital technologies and, and their lives. Thank you very much. I have my question because I want to ask you a question. Yeah. Um, you said in one of the last slides, you said that the dominant vision in emerging technology is uh, the, the idea that technology will solve the problem. But yeah. my that's maybe the dominant vision of the stakeholders. Yes. We know that the dominant vision in academic world, in mass media, and even platform is this one. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so how do we deal with the two dominant vision? I think this one is more dominant than the other right now. How do we move between these two uh, we can say apocalyptic or integrado, apocalyptic integrati, no? Umberto Eco's yeah. uh, opposition. Because in, in, in the same slide, you said how people complicate futures. I think people, I mm -hmm. think that's, that's the idea because people is complicating both dominant visions. And in, yeah, in the, and that's uh, point. I think, yeah, you're absolutely right. Because um, I, for me, I mean, I, I love all of this, this work about surveillance capitalism and, um, and, and automation and the, the dystopian futures that it takes us to but also I mean I feel that that work it, I think it's absolutely brilliant and I think it alerts us to dangers and, and things that we should be concerned about but I also think that it actually ascribes to the same vision as the technological solutionism vision because it plays the story out it follows its logics and it take, often takes its logics to the end and to dystopia Whereas, of course, the technological solutionist narrative takes it to a utopia. Um, so, yes, you're absolutely right. People complicate that vision as well. And that's why I strongly believe that media and communication studies needs to have a real empirical ethnographic base to it so that it doesn't get carried away by theories of the damage that's going to be done to us by these technologies. It's a question to finish. Have you ever used science fiction text in your fieldwork when you talk about the future? I'm not only thinking in Terminator and Apocalyptic, for example, stuff like that, but Ted Chang, I mean, speculative science fiction, maybe short movies. I don't know. Do you think that's useful for helping open the discussion about the future? Yes, absolutely. And um, and that's also the, in terms of the speculative um, documentaries, Juan Salazar's film is a kind of, does have a kind of science fiction component to it as well um and also actually johannes calls his work ethno science fiction as well his filmmaking but i um i don't usually use science fiction but actually most recently i i've started to think about how i might integrate it into my writing because i recently reread a book that i actually first read when i was um at school, I had to I had to read it um, because it was for my exams when I was 16, I think, um, or 18. But um, the machine stops by Forster, which is um, very is a is a book is a short story which actually resonates in such fascinating ways because the people who live in these are isolated in small cell in cells under the ground. They give lectures over the machine. Um, just like we are at the moment, and they wear respirators when they go out because they can't breathe the air on the world's surface, which is very common in, in science fiction anyway, I guess. But um, that particular short story, I think, for me, sparked some really interesting thoughts um, about how we might think about how, but also about how we how we've experienced the pandemic, actually, as well. I think science fiction has probably already given us some very interesting frames through which we've potentially, a lot of people have um, have actually experienced the pandemic through the science fiction narratives that we are actually kind of became part of our lives when we were children. 
Okay, Sarah, thank you very much. Uh, I think we have great inputs, especially for our PhD students. Uh, now, well, for, uh, I'm talking to my uh, our students, PhD students. So now we know that there's a life beyond um, focus groups and interviews. We can do many <laughs> other things. We can apply different kind of techniques to, to, to make the thing work. In both in online and offline environments. Thank you yeah. very, very much for this presentation to open in our uh, vision to the future and to the critical futures. I think this is, we will talk a lot about this conference in the next month. And I think now Wonderful. our PhD students are working on the methodologies, they are finishing the objectives. So th this, all the references that you share in this conference are fantastic for them. So thank you very much. Thank you all participants. I hope next year we can come to Australia or you can come to Barcelona. <laughs> so we, we but in any way, we continue reading your works. You share a lot of information also online, not only books. So thank you very much. Okay, thank you. It's been a great pleasure. Okay. Thanks. La semana de la investigación continúa en half an hour, eh, en 30 minutos, en media hora, tenemos la presentación de tesis doctorales de los grupos Critic, Jobis, Medium. We have the presentation of PhD um, thesis from Critic, Jobis, and Medium. So in 30 minutes, we have another different link. So thank you very much. Uh, here we have a lot of messages from our students. Okay. I keep the session this open so you can read this also. You can check also them. Okay, thank you very much. Thanks for the questions. Also, people that was connected outside, Mon Rodriguez, and also Fernanda Pires. They arrived. The questions arrived via WhatsApp. Well, okay, you can take a coffee, prepare for the second session, and thanks again, Sara. Bye bye. Okay, goodbye. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.